Hi, um, I'd like to start by thanking everyone for coming today. Um, so today's event will take the following format. Each speaker will give a presentation for around 15 to 20 minutes on a specific period of Palestinian architecture. And we'll be covering the mandate period Palestine to present day Palestine. The event will focus on the nexus between architecture and conflict within Palestine, including topics such as architecture and urbanism, as tools for colonialism and resistance in Mandate Palestine, the contemporary challenges that the conflict presents for architects, and the future of Palestinian architecture. After the talks are concluded, there will be time for questions and comments at the end. Um, please post any comments and questions in the chat box, and I will also post some relevant links for those who'd like to do some further reading around today's topic. We'll try to get through as many questions as possible, but the speakers will not see the chat box until after the event. And finally, myself and all speakers are speaking on our own behalf and not that of the Balfour Project. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, first speaker um, Dr. Khaldun Bashara, who is a PhD in socio-cultural anthropology. He is an architect, architect, restorer, and anthropologist. He's currently an assistant professor, professor at the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Birizet University and serves as a senior advisor for the Ruwak Center in Ramallah, where he has worked since 1994 in documenting, protecting, restoring um, Palestinian heritage. Dr. Bashara received his BSc in architectural engineering from Birizet University in 1996 and his MA in Con conservation from the Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium in 2000. He is interested in refugees, space and memory, and he joined the University of California, Irvine on a Fulbright scholarship where he obtained an MA in anthropology in 2009 and his PhD in 2012. Um, I'd like to hand over to him to begin his talk. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Amber, for the introduction. Thank you, Diana, for the invitation. Um, I salute you for this initiative because I think ignorance uh, kills, as they say, and we need to, to inform people about what's happening in Palestine. Uh, so if, uh, if uh, I may uh, share my screen, okay, then it's possible, yes. I prepared this PowerPoint for you. So I am architect, restorer, and anthropologist from Palestine. I worked most of my life in Rewak Center. Uh, Rewak Center is an NGO established in 1991 to document, protect, and restore heritage in Palestine. This is our gallery, actually. The Rewak uh, means, uh, in English, means gallery, and this is uh, the end of the office. Uh, my, uh, my speech will be uh, into five sections. First of all, I will give you a little overview of heritage in Palestine, and then I will introduce you to the geopolitics of heritage, then the state of preservation of heritage in Palestine, and the approach that Rewak has for heritage, and then I will uh, conclude with some remarks about how you can help, how you can assist, what do we need really in Palestine. Uh, first of all, we uh, Heritage, the overview of heritage in Palestine, I will be talking about diversity and intensity of heritage in Palestine. So everybody knows uh, Palestine as the Holy Land, but we have lots of cities like Jerusalem, Nazareth, Acre, Haifa, Jaffa, Gaza, and we employed all the technical aspects in constructing our heritage. Our heritage can be very uh, simple and can be very sophisticated. On the right is a painting, um, a mural painting on a roof of one of the buildings in Jaffa. On the left uh, is the uh, Jasser Palace from 1920 in Bethlehem. So people invest in their uh, structures to show their uh, status and their economic achievements. Also, we have villages in Palestine they used to be more than 800 villages, but now we are talking about the West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza. We know about uh, 422 uh, villages and towns. Hello. Okay. 
So these are some of the villages. This is how Palestine looks like. This is the first village uh, on the top is Jamaim near Nablus, and the one below is uh, Deir Ghassani near Ramallah. We have lots of monuments. This monument is Mamluk uh, fountain in the Haram Sharif of Jerusalem. We have more than 10,000 archaeological sites. These are uncovered sites, but there are, I think, more than this which are not uncovered. This is Sebastia, the Samaria site near Nablus. We have lots of Byzantium architecture, uh, heritage, like this convent uh, in the wilderness of uh, Jericho. We have town, uh, villages from the Ottoman era called the throne villages, where they have palaces and castles who used to uh, gather the taxes for the central government of Turkey, of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, our villages are not beautiful as, as Batir. You can see the village on the right, but you see the terraces, which is very peculiar in Palestine. These terraces are the work of thousands of years of cultivation, of protection of lands to be able to cultivate it. Batir uh, was recently, like three years ago, recognized as a World Heritage Site. We have lots of structures that they are not known or popular, but these are the farmhouses uh, all over uh, the West Bank. You have these wash towers uh, gathering stones to cultivate the land, but instead of throwing the stones away, you build a structure, which is a dry structure, uh, to have a place to stay during uh, harvest, and to watch for your figs and your grapes in the mountains. So if you want to know some of uh, the, Palestinian, the Palestinian landscape, how it looked like uh, before uh, the colored images, this is Ramallah, for instance, in 1910-1915. And this is the construction activity happening on the right, that this is a communal uh, aspect of construction in Palestine. All the village, all the neighbors gather women, kids, men, uh, and the skilled, non-skilled, all of them gathers usually to build a house for somebody. And the houses from inside, they reflect our uh, economy and our activities. Uh, for instance, on the left is a peasant house where you have the animals on the lower part and the family on the upper part with the small furniture and the small uh, equipments. Women, the division of labor was very uh, obvious in our architecture and our crafts. Women were the uh, main activists in the maintenance of the houses, but also in constructing jars and pottery and uh, straw plates and so on uh, for their own houses or for selling. This is the landscape when it used to be without bypasses and settlements. And this is the activity usually had in Palestine, olive gather, uh, harvest or uh, orange harvest was also a social uh, activity. And our industry uh, did not, was not separated from our agricultural industry. So when you have olive oil, then you have a soap factory. And this is the way that soap, uh, olive oil so soap was produced in Naples, for instance. So if I want to tell you about Palestine, this is uh, already known that since Balfour uh, Declaration 1917, our land was shrinking. Our land, which means Palestinian controlled land was shrinking and the Israeli colonial land is expanding. Since 1917, we lost more than 90% uh, of our land. And even on the right, the, 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 uh, the image of 2017 is not really correct because this area is uh, is not all under Palestinian authority or other Palestinian control since Israelis can uh, encourage or invade any uh, Palestinian territory under Palestinian authority or under Israeli control so it's, uh, it does not make sense this map but anyway this is very popular uh, showing Palestine how it is but uh, in in Concrete terms, there are concrete walls around Palestine. I think the British people and the Irish people know about the walls in Belfast because I saw them and I said, okay, well, who is copying who uh, in that moment? But really we have walls of eight meters, 10 meters, 11 meters, barbed wire, uh, technological uh, barriers, uh, 
cameras uh, and all these things are all around the West Bank. So the red line on the right is the wall actually. Part of it is in, in the West Bank, part of it around uh, the West Bank. This was uh, as a result of 2002, uh, 2000 Intifada, but, but really it is, uh, it is the Oslo Agreement result. It's not the Intifada result. From the Oslo Agreement, we have a detachment from Palestine. This means circling Palestine and allowing them to live in their uh, Bundestans and leave uh, the rest for uh, Israel. And if you see the map, the real, the real map of the West Bank, you see small orange points uh, these are Palestinian uh, points. The red ones are the Israeli settlements. And then the white is the military zones under Israeli control. And the Oslo Agreement divided Palestine into ABC, uh, which is uh, A, under Palestinian uh, civil and security control. B is under Palestinian civil control, but under Israeli security control. And the rest, which is 60 2% of the West Bank is under Israeli control. And this area controlled by the Israelis for military purposes, but also for settlement activity. And this created really uh, a lot of uh, pressure on area A under Palestinian uh, control because we have limited lands and we have an increase of population of three to 4% a year, uh, which, which puts us under permanent development pressure. And of course, the land value is increasing all the time in Palestine. Just to give you an idea, since 1993 until now, in 30 years, the land price increased by 30 folds, not by 30% or 300%, by 3,000%. Uh, anyway, the fragmentation has its, its consequences on the discontinuity of Palestine. So Palestine is divided from Palestine because the wall is not dividing Palestine from Israel, but dividing Palestine from Palestinian community on the other side of the wall. There are communities who are encircled totally from all directions, but only one gate, like Beit Iksa, that I will show in a minute, uh, by the wall. Uh, and the destruction happens and is still happening. Uh, this is in 2002 when Israeli incurs into Nablus and destroyed the huge uh, soap factories that I showed you one of them. Um, this is recent in the last uh, war on Gaza. There is a, the land on the left, you can see it, and then all of it destroyed, including the vegetation and the houses and the barracks. So the destruction is happening since 1948 until now. But there is also another type of destruction, which is not Israeli destruction. This is Palestinian bulldozer bulldozing a 1920 building uh, to make room for a high rise building. Uh, this is a typical in Palestine because uh, heritage is not recognized, heritage is not protected, and we need the space to build the new houses and the new towers for the uh, population, a natu natural increase of population. So to give you a, a hint uh, on, on what the state of preservation of heritage in Palestine, I started with this image, but I would say always and I wrote about it, that uh, we are still in a colonial uh, imagery or a colonial discourse, even if we claim to live a post-colonial moment, which I think is uh, exaggerated, exaggerated to live a post-colonial uh, moment because we are still under occupation circle. We don't have borders. We don't have airports. We don't have harbors. We are not in control of our passports or our taxes or our uh, resources, gas, oil, or uh, salts from the Dead Sea, these are all under Israeli control. Uh, but uh, why, why we are still living a colonial legacy? I think uh, I claim that the Palestinian Authority did not prioritize heritage in post Oslo. And this is very clear in the budgetary lines of the Palestinian Authority. I'll show you in a, in a minute that the Palestinian Authority do, uh, does not spend on heritage. They don't acknowledge it as a result. Uh, value is not recognized because what do we want to restore? Is a memory or money? If you want memory, then you restore. If you want money, you destroy. Uh, one house, which is on Ramallah, uh, a plot of land can, uh, the plot of land can give you like millions of dollars. The house, the old house does not give you anything. So it's better to put it down and build that tower. 
Also, we have a lack of human resources uh, uh, and knowledge at local levels. We don't know how to restore. This is really now is changing because of rework and the like institutions, uh, but uh, the, uh, the vanishing uh, building related arts with uh, modernity uh, makes it difficult for us to restore. There are uh, laws in Palestine, but they are very weak. Uh, and these are laws, still a colonial law from British Band Aid 1929. And even the law that adopted by the uh, Palestinian Authority in 2018 has the same weaknesses and the same time frames. They acknowledge time to protect things rather than uh, value that has to do with people, with their experiences, with their, uh, with their knowledge, with their uh, aspirations they put uh, time frame on what is important, what's not important. Anyway, after post uh, uh, Oslo agreement, we have new efforts and initiatives to protect heritage in Palestine. And this is, comes to, uh, to the priorities of the Palestinian Authority. On the right, you see the, the chart that shows the Palestinian Authority is pending. And there is no culture or heritage in this uh, in this chart. There is, uh, of course, 31% goes to military or police, more than the, the Americans, more than the Israelis, and more than the British. We spend one third of our budget, at least one third, on security that is not achievable. Uh, while we don't spend, we spend less than 1% on culture and heritage, less than 1%. Ministry of Culture and Ministry of Tourism and Antiquity budget combined is less than one person. And this is what we uh, can term as suicide. This is the Palestinian emblem, and this is the real suicide budget and suicide way of dealing with uh, colonization. Anyway, but uh, in post-Oslo uh, agreement, we have initiatives that try to uh, rehabilitate and restore heritage in Palestine. For instance, in Jerusalem and Nablus city, we have the Welfare Association. In Hebrew and Old City, we have the Hebrew Rehabilitation Committee. In Bethlehem Governorate, we have the Center for Cultural Heritage Preservation. Of course, we have other institutions like AUKAF, Ministry of Tourism, Antiquity, UNDP, uh, Center of Iwan in, Jer uh, in Gaza. Private sector are very strong in restoring things for their purposes, restaurants, hotels, shops and so on, they, they are very, uh, uh, very supportive when it comes to their businesses. Of course, Palestine, uh, Rewalk. Rewalk works mainly uh, in Gaza, but focusing on rural Palestine. Why rural Palestine? Because rural Palestine is house for most of our heritage, and it is not protected, it's not cared for, and, and not recognized as an asset, and mostly abandoned and home for the poor, those who remain in old houses because they cannot afford living in new one. And we have ownership problems because uh, the uh, inheritance system of Palestine goes from the, the grandfather to the kids, the whole, the whole family. And so the one house can be owned by uh, hundreds of people. So uh, I will show you Rewalk approach. Rewalk approach, why I, we call it from passive to pragmatic or proactive, aggressive, responsive approach. Because in Palestine, we have, uh, we inherited, I think, the strong civil society uh, institutions because we did not deal with the occupation. We, we did not want to deal with the occupation and therefore it created institutions, NGOs, small uh, shadow governments almost. So Rewak started uh, with documentation and modeling, how to write about history in Palestine, how to write about techniques in Palestine, and how to do restorations in Palestine. So these are small and moderate beginnings. And in 1994, we decided to say, what do we have really in Palestine that's worth protecting? And we started the National Register in Rewak. Between uh, two, uh, 1994 and 2004, we entered every historic house and make it an ID card. An ID card that contains all the information about the house, a sketch, a photograph, uh, the name, the owner, the use, the description, the openings, the ceilings, the, the state of preservation, and so on. So we managed by 2006 to publish this 10 years uh, of work. Uh, gathering 50,320 historic buildings in this registry uh, in 422 towns and villages in Jerusalem, 
East Jerusalem, West Bank, and Gaza Strip. This was the launching of the book in 2006. But we, along the line, Palestinians, they acknowledge the, the, uh, the documentation, but they want to see how Palestine could look like if it's renovated. So it's seeing by uh, believing by knowing or by seeing things happening uh, on, uh, on the side. So in 2001, with the second intifada, we started the job creation through restoration. The aim of this project was to create jobs. So we managed to create, these are uh, fireworks, if you listen to them, somebody is getting married, so we have to suffer because they are happy. So uh, between uh, 2001 and now, we managed to restore more than 130 community centers, cultural centers, women centers, in more than 150 villages and more, more than 100 in villages and more than 30 in, uh, in towns and cities. We created more than 1 million jobs, 1 million work days through spending more than $20 million. So we tried to prove that it is uh, not uh, only uh, reasonable and affordable, but feasible to restore heritage. So these are some of the examples. This is Al uh, Khawaja uh, Palace, which was restored in the community center. Uh, and this is Jama'in Palace, Sheikh Palace, which was converted to a women's center. This is Al Kamanjati, a small institution who teaches uh, kids uh, music. They, they have so far since 2004 and now uh, taught 10,000 kids uh, on uh, music instruments. We try to be contemporary while uh, restoring uh, buildings because we want to show the difference actually, the difference that can happen to our heritage. The quality of restoration which has to do with, uh, with the traditional techniques, but also putting some modern aspects in the, uh, in the houses or the offices we restore. The buildings that we restore, they become spaces for social change, we call it. People, they gather there, they make their festivals there, they make their mornings there, they make their activities there. Women gather, elderly gather, children, uh, libraries, and so on. And we use these uh, sites for knowledge production because techniques are, uh, um, uh, they vanished with modernity. So we try to make them again. So we train architects, workmen, uh, uh, the blacksmith, carpentry on how to do traditional techniques and traditional details for our restored buildings. Even painting, mural paintings like the one I showed. In the beginning, this is a workshop of, uh, by a specialist from uh, Belgium who came and painted this whole uh, roof with our architects and our painters. Now we know the technique. These are our workers on sites. So it's not enough to restore one building. So we came up with uh, a large, we call it aggressive approach, almost a strategy for Palestine. Instead of dealing with uh, 422 sites, uh, we said, let's concentrate on 50 villages and towns. And these 50 villages and towns constitute 50% of our heritage. And through doing this, we will be able to create uh, a, a new geography. We call it Geography 101 for Palestine before colonization, before destruction, before our social relation uh, destroyed with a new modern uh, mode of production and so on. This is how we envision how to recreate Palestine anew. And uh, instead of dealing with one building, we go in a city or a village or a town, we restore the whole neighborhoods, we create houses, community centers, playgrounds. For instance, this is Beit Iqsa, near the settlement Givad Ze'ev, near Jerusalem. It is a steam zone, which means you cannot enter in this village only from one gate with Israeli soldier control. So we managed to recreate the whole center restoration, community garden, and a women's center and a, a library and the plaza, which is important for people to come together and discuss their future and their, their life. Another place is Abuen near Ramallah. This is the site before restoration. It's all debris and ruins. 
and the below image is after restoration. We try to make it a, uh, we made it a, a ruined park, they call it. You, kids can go and enjoy uh, in a safe uh, atmosphere uh, the, uh, the village. And this is, these are the buildings after renovation, places for music, places for libraries, circus school or institutions uh, in the middle of the historic uh, centers. People gather, people talk, artistic uh, interventions happen as well, and teaching kids on, uh, on heritage techniques to be able to value the things that they are not valued from their fathers or even grandfathers. These are the sites when we when renovated. And now, just to, to end up, it's like, it's, it's almost taken for granted that we can do anything in Palestine, which is, uh, I think, correct. But we need uh, a lot of help. We need a lot of help. I think, for instance, Rewalk is NGO, which means all our budget is by uh, aid. Uh, usually it's one third European, one third Arab world, and one third Palestinian. So we try to diversify our our sources and people help us. Uh, they are, they know now after 30 years of work that uh, it is not luxury to protect heritage in Palestine. It is one of the basic rights to protect heritage because it is this relation between heritage and identity and nation building is entrenched in the heritage. So we have to do it. And so people, they support us sometimes on the basis of job creation, sometimes on the basis of creating a women's center, sometimes on the basis of creating, uh, creating a better environment in the 50 villages uh, for pa Palestinians. So uh, I would say, if you want to help uh, Palestine, visit Palestine. I know the image is not like the one on the left, it's rather on the, the one on the right, which is an artwork, by the way. But anyway, visit Palestine, uh, because once you visit Palestine, you think, you change your mind. Uh, ignorance kills, because sometimes people are in support of Palestine without knowing why, or in support with Israel without knowing uh, why. So I prefer enemy that acknowledgeable rather than an enemy who is ignorant and he doesn't know why he's supporting Palestine. So spread the word. Once you come to Palestine and visit, spread the word, which is very important to Palestine. We consider every visitor. I think more than 2 million uh, visit Palestine every year. I hope after uh, Corona is, uh, is over, we'll have this number or more. Once we have 2 million visitors, we have 2 million ambassadors because our embassies are not functional. So I, I, we rely on visitors to, to convey the message to their people. And you can also not only spread the word, but you come and volunteer, volunteer with the Palestinian universities, with Rewalk or the other NGOs, you do restoration yourself, you make documentation, you protect yourself, you become part of our uh, work. Also, you can donate, you can donate by going onto all these nice images, the one image uh, in the middle with, with the lady is Saad Amri, the founder. She, she formed uh, the founder's uh, endowment and she uh, helps gather money uh, for the sake of reward. Also, we make it easier for people to donate over the internet uh, by visiting Rewalk Give, and they can give to women, they can give to Jubi Creation, they can give Jer to Jerusalem, to the founder, to the institution. Also, you can be so uh, nice to go and visit Rewalk Bookshop and buy uh, a book from Rewalk. This will help us make more books because we think, as uh, this is in our website, Said, uh, Edward Said says, a person who no longer has a homeland takes writing as a home. So I think we started in Rewalk writing books and I am the editor series, the series editor since 2010. We so far managed to publish 24 books on different cities, on different techniques, on different phenomena of architecture in Palestine. So I, I uh, encourage you to visit our website and to be uh, uh, part of our uh, dream to restore 50 villages and to make Palestine really livable again. Thank you for listening. Oops, 
sorry I didn't realize I was on mute but I just wanted to say thank you so much for such an interesting presentation and for the beautiful photos in the presentation as well um I'd now like to introduce our next speaker um Dr Abdul Rahman Katana who is a doctor in architecture and co-founder of the Yalla project which is a research hub on socio-spatial development in Palestine Dr. Katana obtained his BA in architectural engineering from Birzat University in Palestine. His master's degree is in architectural regeneration from Oxford Brookes University in England, and his doctoral degree is from the University of Leuven in Belgium. Sorry, excuse me. He currently joins the academic staff of the Department of Architectural Engineering at Birzat University as an assistant professor. His teaching experience includes architectural design, urban regeneration and urban design. His research interests are city and war, urban resilience, architectural and urban development, and architectural history and theory. His practical experience concentrates on urban regeneration and development. I would like to hand over to him to begin his presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Amber. Thank you very much uh, for all the attendees and thank you for um, inviting me for this session. Uh, actually, in my presentation, I will take you into another um, front on the Palestinian multiple fronts in the last 100 years. So mainly I will be talking about um, uh, architecture and urbanism as um, acts of resistance in the mandate uh, Palestine. So can, can you see my um, screen now? You see the full screen, right? Yeah, we can see. Okay. Do you see my notes? No, we don't see your notes. Okay, great. Good Just news. what we're meant to see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay, actually, this um, what I'm going to present today is um, is actually a continuation of my doctoral research that I accomplished in KU Leuven in in, in, uh, in Belgium last few years, and actually in this uh, in my research. I was questioning the Palestinian resistance against the Zionist project in Palestine. And actually, um, my main interest was to question the agency of architecture and urban tissue in the civilian resistance during urban warfare. So actually, um, so I actually did the research on the contemporary episodes of war, which is mainly during the Second Intifada in Nablus. And there I analyzed how architecture facilitates or hinders the Palestinian practices of resistance or resilience during, uh, during the combat, so during the intense combat. Um, but of course, my research had to revisit the last 100 years of confrontation between the Palestinian self-determination project and the Zionist settler colonial uh, project. And uh, actually throughout my research, I could conclude or understand that in this ongoing narrative of Palestinian resistance against the Zionist colonial project, architecture is actually an open signifier and space is an instrument in this uh, confrontation. But in this presentation, I will not tell the story of the last 100 years. I will focus on the British mandate era to present some aspects of how architecture and planning were instrumentalized in this confrontation. Before talking about the British era, actually, I just want to highlight how we entered this British mandate era, actually, how the Palestinian society stepped into this period. And here I give some uh, a quick glimpse on this. So actually between 1914 and 1918, the Palestinian community suffered from the First World War where almost 75% of the conscripts did not come back to their homes, which means we lost 75% of our working force. And also we had a great, like the Great Famine of the Levant, which actually it's estimated roughly to have um, um, killed almost 25% of the population. And we also had the locust invasion and the severe drought. Altogether, 
have led to the loss of working force, a severe loss of working force, disrupted social structure, loss of agricultural production and of arable land, the disruption of social and economic sectors that depends also on agriculture, and indeed the loss of cash. Ending, uh, exiting from this era, from this uh, stage, the First World War, we came as Palestinian community to face two major projects and two international projects, actually. So the, the British colonial, I call it colonial project here, and the Zionist, the Zionist settler colonial project, which were tied and connected to each other via Belfort Declaration that supported or showed that the British a mandate will be in favor of the creation of the uh, Jewish state in Palestine. And actually, settler colonialism theory is best to describe this because I think I just read because colonial settlers aim to drive indigenous people out of their homelands, grab control of their lands and resources, and supplant their cultures and social structures to become the places in new legal residence. And this is exactly what was happening. So it was, it was not coming to live beside or coming to live with or coming to live behind, it is coming to live in, in the place of others, which means that everything in our life becomes part of this confrontation. So within this understanding, the Zionist project that is supported also by the British administration actually used architecture and urbanism as tools of control and colonization. And I will go quickly through some colonial tactics during the British mandate because I will talk more about the resistance. And here I can mention that uh, one major tool was urban planning. And this was very clear from the very beginning with Patrick Giddes' plan for Jerusalem, which was actually prepared at in 1919, which means even before the mandate was on officially onset. And actually, um, Geddes himself was actually re recruited in London by, and he was um, nominated by a Zionist, uh, by the Zionist party. And um, as Noah Rubin described, he is presented as colonial town planner who had aspired to serve both British and Jewish over the control of identity and space in contested Palestine. So urban planning is a huge issue. I will not talk about it now, but also there is another aspect, which was the infrastructural projects. Here you can see um, a caricature by the Palestine newspaper that was published in 1936. And in this, uh, it, the, the, the title of the caricature says, what is uh, Balfour Declaration, and it numbers the, a list of major infrastructural or major mega projects that the concessions were given to the Jew, despite the calls by Arabs to have concessions for such projects. So like the Jewish Rutenberg um, uh, concession, which is about the electricity, which is still until now working as the major electricity company, the athlete, which is, and the Dead Sea concessions, which is about minerals, holy monopoly of public work, all of these concessions actually, there they were uh, at the beginning requested or required or applied for by Arabs and even during the the, the Ottoman Empire, or Putin, uh, during the Ottoman era, some of these concessions were given to Arabs, like uh, the Rottenberg concession and the Dead Sea concession, and of course and the tramway of Jerusalem, for example. Uh, and this is also another long story that we can talk about in a different occasion. Uh, also, another tactic was using military operations as urban redesign of the Palestinian Kaspa. And the major um, activity that has happened was the redesign of Jaffa Old Town in the Operation Ankur, which the authorities actually claimed that they are going to beautify the city to make it pure, clean, and hygienic, while actually to, to control the Palestinian uh, revolutionists and to get access inside the old town of the Kaspa was the major reason. And we see how they opened an anchor like uh, bolivars inside the, the, the Kaspa, inside the Kaspa of Jaffa. And here are some images from the destruction of the houses. Here is another example of urban redesign through military operations. So this is a new street that was opened in Nablus and it was also manifested as a, a, a new development, but actually it is to facilitate the, the, the movement of the military trucks inside the souk of Nablus. And the same happened almost the same in, in Jenin as well. This is a photo from Jenin. 
All this happened in 1936, actually, most of this. And uh, another aspect of uh, using architecture and urbanism is the militarization of domestic spaces, uh, homes, um, um, factories, um, sports centers, and the clubs or whatever, to, to control the everyday activities of urban centers. So they occupy key buildings inside the urban center to control the movement of people and to, 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 to show the presence of army to, to threaten the people if they are thinking about revolution or making uh, demonstrations. Another tactic was the uh, military or defensive architecture. Um, the British found out that they, they really need to, um, to occupy Palestine militarily. And this was uh, maybe a conclusion or an, a conclusion that was drawn when they were studying how they were dealing with the revolution in 1936. So they decided to reoccupy the, the, the land with army and they built about 65 fortresses that they were called Tigard fortress, fortresses. And uh, these fortresses are really in, carrying the, the style of defensive architecture. So this is an image of the fortress in Nablus that was supposed to, to, to house uh, officers and army soldiers with their families. And it is supposed to survive for three months under complete siege. So it has all the amenities and capabilities to survive for a long time under siege. So on the other side, we see that uh, I saw that uh, also Arabs employed architecture uh, in their resistance. So resistance to this colonial project or to the British administration, it started actually before the British mandate uh, was in, in, in action. And there, are, there were different and multiple civilian and armed forms of resistance. Maybe today it's more about civilian forms of, of resistance because it was about how we used architecture in, in our uh, confrontation. So one uh, tactic is to use architecture as a national identity. And here, the mosque, uh, Hassan Beg Mosque, that was built by the last Ottoman governor of the city of Jaffa to block the expansion of Tel Aviv toward the sea. Uh, Tel Aviv city was just starting at that time, and the mosque uh, was to, 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 to pull the expansion of Jaffa, of Jaffa towards the north to block the, the expansion of Tel Aviv toward the sea and to highlight the, the, uh, Arab nation, the Arab identity of the city. Another example is the Palace Hotel in Jerusalem, which was built by the Supreme Muslim Court Council in 1929. Uh, and actually, as you can see, this was um, an expansion outside the walls. So we can see here the Jaffa Gate, Jaffa Gate of Jerusalem. And the uh, Palace Hotel is in this area. And most of these buildings were Jewish buildings. So, and the uh, King David Hotel was still under construction. So the Supreme Council, uh, the Muslim, Supreme Muslim Council decided to build another, um, another hotel to receive guests and visitors. And to, they paid more so it can be ready before the King David Hotel is ready. So it is also to highlight the Arabic identity of that area and to to, and to enforce the Arabic presence in that area. And of course, the style was also uh, to show the Arab identity of architecture in that place. Another tactic was also buying, um, uh, buying Jewish buildings and or building Arab uh, buildings inside Jewish or inside places where Jewish buildings are expanding. So these are um, some uh, pieces of news from Arabic newspapers where they were highlighting the, the national feelings and the patriotic act actions by some Arabs who were buying um, uh, Jewish uh, buildings or even building in an area that is threatened by Jew uh, Jewish uh, colonialists to, to build more buildings in it. Another um, project, for example, was uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque University, which was uh, a project proposed by the Supreme Muslim Council in Jerusalem. The project was actually aiming to make Jerusalem an attraction for Muslims or for Muslim scholars and students to come from all over Muslim countries and to make Jerusalem as a Muslim cultural center and an Arab identity that expanding in the old city and in the new city of Jerusalem. And also to reinforce that Jerusalem is 
is not only a Palestinian Arab or Muslim city, it is a national, uh, it is a Muslim city for all Muslims uh, in the world. The, 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 it seems that the project did not, did not proceed, but um, some colleges were actually um, started to work maybe in some buildings, but uh, the building itself that we see now with these um, images, these are just uh, drawings and um, and models for the, the design, but the project was not materialized on the ground. And actually there is another aspect which was also very um, prevalent, which Palestinians were using the urban fabric of the and architecture of the city in their hit and run tactics, either in Nablus or in, in Jerusalem or in Jaffa or everywhere. So this is a drawing from uh, explaining or showing the revolutionists in Nablus um, firing on, British tanks, but also using the, the rooftops of the buildings to control from above. And the, the newspapers are full of news about the tactics that Palestinians were using in their built environment, use, making use of the potentials that the built environment and the architecture of the buildings is giving. And here I analyze some of the uh, tactics on attacking some um, militarized buildings that the British army occupied around Nablus and how Palestinians were using these, uh, the, using the, the narrow alleyways of the Kaspa to attack and run. Um, I will quickly go to the, mist, the most prominent maybe episode in this war and using architecture and urbanism in this war, which is the war for Jaffa actually. The war for Jaffa signifies a lot about uh, the potentiality of architecture and urbanism to erase a community and establish another community. So Tel Aviv was established as a Jewish neighborhood that you see here in, in shadowed with uh, a bit blue. It was a Jewish neighborhood in the city of Jaffa. But the intention, of course, was to create what they call a pure Jewish city, which is only for Jew, that attracts Jewish from all over the world to come and live in, in this city and to expand it and make it the, the, the attraction for all Jew. And we can see this timeline, this, these drawings were made by one of my students at Kayuluven who did her master thesis about the, 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 um, the war of Jaffa or the war for Jaffa. So this shows the timeline, how, how the, the Jewish settlements, which is in blue here, has encircled Jaffa, Jaffa or do, um, along the time where the Jewish neighborhood actually swallowed the mother, swallowed their mother, the, the Jaffa, and they controlled it from all, all sides. And to do this, there were also, there were multiple uh, tactics and multiple um, strategies, maybe um, legal and special tactics and strategies, including the annexation of uh, Jewish neighborhoods of Jaffa. So Jaffa had many, um, had multiple Jewish neighborhoods within the boundaries of Jaffa. So Tel Aviv started to call for these um, uh, neighborhoods to be annexed to, to the borders of, of uh, Tel Aviv. And this was an issue that lasted until, until the establishment of the Zionist state, which is Israel. So if we look at the house Jaffa was encircled, we see that many, um, many um, Israeli or Jewish settlements started to emerge in addition to some outposts, uh, Jewish outposts, and now out outposts were just factories or, um, or um, um, schools or maybe homes, but they were scattered around Jaffa to, to make a kind of encirclement around uh, Jaffa. And actually, this was tightening Jaffa by the time, a bit by bit. And of course, Arabs were aware about these, and they were trying hard to, to, to get rid of this um, um, encirclement. And here you can see in the yellow, the spaces or the, uh, the areas where the Arabs were trying to establish some wedges to, to, to break this encirclement of Jewish settlements around um, Jaffa. And uh, actually here, um, for example, the Arab committees, which was responsible for defending the Arab cause in Palestine during the British mandate. Here, it's, um, it, it is a translation of the call they sent to the um, Department of Land Settlement, asking the Department of Land Settlement to keep these uh, blocks, urban blocks in red here. I hope you can see them well. 
to keep these blocks uh, only for Arab development. So these blocks were actually under the control of the state, so their state, they were state land. Actually, they were not completely state land. Uh, conflict with original owners, Arab owners, with the state was still until that moment on these most of these urban blocks. But the Arabs were trying to have to serve these blocks for the Arab expansion, as you see, because here on in this area, um, the Haulon settlement and on the next to the sea, it is Batyam. So this is the only place that is left between Haulon and Batyam. So these empty blocks, the ones that are left, are the only empty blocks. And Arabs, Arabs wanted to secure the, the French, uh, the, the witch to get inside be, or in between these two settlements. And um, here comes a, a private uh, Arab company that was called the Riyadh Company, and it was one of its activities or its main activity actually is to to pray, to, to establish Arab um, in, uh, constructions or Arab settlements or Arab uh, neighborhoods in such places that are threatened to be part of the encirclement of uh, of um, of um, Jaffa. And here we see the application, and this is an application by uh, a Riyadh company to have this urban block that is in yellow here. So this urban block was actually requested by the Sharikat, by a Riyadh company to, to build a housing uh, in it. But when they applied, they found that Shikun company, which is an Israeli company and Jewish company at the time, has also asked to have this place uh, for uh, another housing for the, the Jewish settlers. So this contestation over, over these blocks was intensified uh, most of the time. And actually, this is another project. It is also in the same um, uh, area. It is by the Jaffa Municipality Corporation. So they could acquire a land and for public use in between Holon and Batyam to build uh, um, an Arab um, ex-serviceman um, housing. And actually, they uh, they they didn't build it because the 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 agreement or the the permit or maybe the application for fund was approved maybe two weeks before uh, the the actually before the war or before the battle the real battle of Jaffa. So it was in 40, 1948 when it was approved, but it was too late to build any Arab. Uh, settlement there, and I will end with a story about this very nice building, which was Hasbun, is um, a Hasbun factory. It was a cigarette factory that was built by this merchant, a uh, Jaffa merchant, an Arab merchant, to, to produce uh, cigarettes and tobacco. And actually, he got bankrupted. And the house lies on a, a very strategic location on the main road between, road between Jaffa and Jerusalem. So the Jewish, um, uh, so the, the banks put this in uh, auction, put the, the property in auction, and the, the Jewish um, uh, National Fund could buy this uh, land because of its strategic location. So they bought the, the land with the house because of the strategic location. And actually this house became one of the most aggressive outposts of the uh, Haganah and the Jewish military to control the roads uh, that is uh, going out of Jaffa or entering Jaffa. And this was one of the hardest uh, outposts that was attacked by Arab revolutionists many times, and at the end it was uh, destroyed. So it was built by an Arab to, to be a productive site, a production for wealth and the economy, but at the end Arabs destroyed it because it was the threat on securing the, the, the road to Jerusalem. So I end by this, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much for such an interesting talk. Um, I'd like to introduce our final speaker, um, Ms. Dana Massad. Dana Massad is a faculty member of the Department of Design at Birza University. She is a mother, an architect, and an environmental activist and co-founder of an independent design studio, Shumps Art, based in Ramallah between 2012 and 2017. She is an active member in several, several community-based initi initiatives and a board member of the Sakakini Sika Cultural Center. Sorry for butchering the pronunciation there. Um, I'll hand over to Ms. Masai. Thank you, Dana. Um, 
to begin her talk. Thank you, Amber. Um, uh, thank you for this invitation to uh, speak about my work. Let me share my screen. Okay, just bear with me. I am um, just fixing the screen for you now. You okay, Donna? Yeah, I can't find it anymore. I'm not sure it happened. Um, yeah, just bear with me a moment. Try to work through it again. Okay, here it is. Just bear with us, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> and if you have any questions from the past um, two speakers, do pop, pop them in the chat box. We are going to have a Q&A with all three of our speakers today at the end of all three presentations. So if you have any questions, pop them in the chat box. Here we go. Okay, are you seeing my screen? Yes, we are. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, hello, uh, thank you, Amber, again for for this opportunity. Um, I will be speaking um, about my work in Shams Art um, and also giving a little bit of context um, on Earth architecture in Palestine. Um, uh, as Amber mentioned, uh, Shams Art uh, was co-founded in 2012 by myself and. Uh, uh, three other architects, Lina Saleh, Rami Kasberi, Ghaif Nassar, and, um, and we were later joined by um, uh, Dima Khouri in 2014. The office was in operation, the studio was in operation until 2017. Um, and uh, we offered landscape interior furniture design services. However, um, for the sake of this presentation, I will be focusing on the earth um, architecture part. Uh, first, with the, um, a little background on earth architecture in Palestine. Sorry, can I just ask if you could speak a little bit louder, if that's all right? Just because you're a little bit quiet. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so this, uh, can you see the photo? Yeah, hello? Yeah, we can see. Okay, I'm getting a connect, uh, the internet is unstable, so um, hopefully I can make it through this presentation. So uh, the hill um, in this photo is of um, ancient Jericho, uh, one of the oldest known cities in the world. Um, Jericho, uh, uh, ancient Jericho is around 10,000 years old um, and is uh, built entirely out of mud brick. In fact, some of the um, the walls and structures of uh, of the city of the city dwellings are still intact after all this time. Um, Earth architecture has been used in this um, in region for uh, at least ten thousand years old. Um, it's a, a continuously um, used knowledge and therefore um, accumulated and embodied indigenous knowledge. Um, up until the mid uh, 20th century. Here are some more examples of earth architecture in different regions in Palestine. Uh, the photos on the um, on the left side of, on the right side of the screen are of Zdud, um, a Palestinian town on the Mediterranean, showing the vernacular architecture typical to that coastal area. 
um, with painted plaster, high ceilings, a small high openings and a thick palm leaf roof. Um, the photo on the left side shows Jericho with examples of peasant housing and of commercial and public buildings. At this point in time, terracotta roofing tiles were imported from France and used um, by the more affluent. Um, the building in the center of the, of the photo on the right side of the screen is uh, the Jordan Hotel, which was built um, in the British Mandate period um, and uh, caters for pilgrims and other foreign nationals um, associated typically with the British uh, mandate um, in the center and that's in the center and on the on the uh, foreground of the photo you can see um, housing of peasants uh, uh, in mud brick and, and with roofing um, made of uh, layers of wood straw and earth. Um, other examples of earth architecture here, conical um, domes, uh, this time from Syria between, uh, this area between Homs and um, Aleppo um, and similar uh, conical uh, dome roof in the Palestinian Northern Jordan Valley. Uh, an example of a larger building, this time uh, built in the Ottoman period. This is the um, uh, Winter Palace in Jericho. Uh, the walls are mud brick with uh, wood bracing and the roof is terracotta tile. Um, this building was partially destroyed in the 2027 earthquake and uh, rebuilt. Um, and we will see other pictures of how it exists today. Um, Earth is used um, uh, traditionally in Palestine, not only as a building material, um, but also for uh, building furniture, tools, and um, even in homes that are stone houses, we can find buildings, we can find uh, structures for storage of grains um, built out of Earth. Therefore, there's a, a great variety of um, earthen techniques, earth mixes and plaster mixes, depending on function. Uh, Abdurrahman mentioned the, the great destruction of building heritage prior to 1948. Um, and um, in 1948, 1947 to 1948, uh, continuation of this, um, through Nakbe, where over 500 Palestinian villages were destroyed um, uh, by Zionist forces. Um, much of, as far as Earth, because this presentation is, is on Earth, uh, much of the Earth and building heritage was destroyed as well. Lives and livelihoods and social structures were interrupted, continue, continued to be interrupted. Um, and scattered, which all contributed uh, to a great loss of indigenous building knowledge. Um, back to this photo, this time I want to uh, focus your attention on the, on the settlement to the um, left of the screen, the bottom left of the screen. Uh, this is uh, the Sultan refugee camp set up by UNRWA. It was the United Nations Relief and Work Agency commissioned by uh, the UN um, General Assembly to assist Palestinian refugees. They set up this uh, refugee camp in 1948 to house refugees from Lid and uh, Ramle um, uh, in tents. And later in 1951, Unruh replaced refugee tents um, with one, uh, one room structures with the uh, courtyard. Um, in uh, most of the refugee camps in the air, in the region, in in the West Bank, Gaza, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, um, this was also the case in Tel Aviv Sultan, a refugee camp. However, the lack of proper infrastructure um, contributed to the quick deterioration um, of the built in, of the buildings, and unfortunately, also tied the image of earthen buildings. Uh, with the trauma of displacement and the hardship of living in a refugee camp. These photos are from UNRWA's report on Tel Sultan refugee camp showing um, an inhabited yet um, partially um, collapsed 
mud brick home on the right side um, and damaged to a roof and uh, the lower parts of um, what looks like water da damage from um, um, uh, from the poor infrastructure um, on uh, the left side of the street. So um, these are some of the buildings, um, earth buildings around Jericho specifically, um, left to deteriorate earth architecture as all natural building um, requires um, maintenance. And these buildings, since they've been abandoned, um, uh, are left in the state and um, uh, also, in my opinion, contributing to the stigma of uh, earth architecture um, and um, tying the image of, of earth with uh, non-reliability and non-durability. Um, I would love, I mean, Khaldun knows a lot more about um, architectural conservation. I'm not going to speak um, about it, but I would love to hear his opinion on, uh, on the conservation um, of earth architecture, as I feel there's um, not a lot of, um, uh, of, in of interest or attention being paid to uh, this, this type of uh, architecture. Uh, by the late mid-century, people in the Jordan Valley and elsewhere in the occupied Palestinian territories were moving away from traditional building materials. Um, today, most building, uh, buildings in the West Bank and Gaza are built in concrete and cement blocks. In many cities in the West Bank, it is mandatory um, by municipal law to clad the building in stone. And this law is inherited from the British mandate period and is still in effect today. Um, and one of uh, the consequences of it is the maiming of landscapes by stone quarries through mountainous regions in the West Bank. So the main building materials, um, right, uh, conventionally now is our stone and cement and aggregate from these stone quarries. And you can see, um, uh, you can see these quarries all over, scattered all over the West Bank, especially the mountainous regions. In the left corner is a photo of a quarry in Hebron. Um, this is an Israeli owned quarry, even though, um, uh, quarrying in the West Bank is illegal and prohibited by uh, Geneva Convention. Israel um, owns and operates tens, if not hundreds, of um, stone quarries in the West Bank. Bank. The one on the right side of the screen is a Palestinian owned private uh, stone quarry in Jama'in near Nablus um, uh, because um, of the lack of access to um, limited access to land. Palestinians, um, in this case, are quarrying um, in areas that are right adjacent to um, residential areas. Um, cement is the other building material, main building material, and is monopolized by um, the Israeli company Nasher. I think, Abdurrahman, can, you can answer to this if this was also another, um, what did you call it, privilege? given to um, the Jews uh, prior to 1948. Um, it was the only cement um, factory in, in Israel up until today and, up, and um, uh, supplies Palestinians uh, uh, with 80% of um, cement in, to Gaza and the West Bank. Um, since Israel has complete control over what goes in and out of the West Bank and Gaza, they, um, Israel controls um, rations, um, allowing or banning entry of cement um, to, um, for political gain. Um, so these are really just the, some background and um, uh, the, the circumstances that um, uh, produced a reaction of um, architects, the architects of us who uh, started Shams Art, we, um, we, our goal was to find alternatives to building materials um, that, um, um, that we have control over and that respond to our local um, environmental, social, and 
political context. So um, here are, is a picture of Shams our team and um, our vision is um, sovereignty over building materials, um, building without environmental degradation, zero waste, decreasing energy needs uh, and countering the stigma of earth buildings through creating examples to be followed um, and reviving traditional building knowledge. Um, it's quite an ambitious list, but as you can see in the photos, very young. Um, we began uh, our work with experimentation the first year, 2012, was so uh, there's a lot of experimentation and building uh, mixes and materials and, and techniques, and uh, eventually we uh, adopted uh, compressed earth blocks as, uh, as the way to start. Um, uh, um, our buildings, the first building, uh, and we did so for two reasons. So we um, we saw great potential um, in the strength of compressed earth blocks, which allow for greater spans, um, and also um, the stabilization, which is using lime or cement in very um, low percentages. Um, allowed for uh, durability and weather resistance, um, all which we viewed as would contribute to um, um, bettering the image of, of, uh, of Earth architecture. Um, we also chose compressed earth blocks because we have we had very little, if any, knowledge of the traditional building techniques and, and, and mixes and because the, there's very, very little research and documentation of it, unfortunately. So these are uh, pictures of the uh, first building that we built in Ramallah. Um, Paika building is a exhibition space. It's a, just one room, it's a small building and um, in the botanical garden in Ramallah and we, it was built, um, it, it was um, deliberately very small because uh, Ramallah has uh, the um, stone cladding law and in order for us to, uh, um, to avoid having to clad this building in stone, we found a loophole in this building law where uh, if it's built under 50 square meters, it's uh, considered a um, a secondary building and doesn't need to meet this um, this law. Um, this is these are photos of the finished building, um, the second building, or actually I'm not showing all the buildings here, just a few examples. So this one building is a um, uh, um, restaurant in Duke near Jericho, and and in this case our client was. Um, Man Development Center, and uh, along with Man, we developed this uh, uh, compressing machine, uh, which uh, allowed uh, for the production of four bricks at at a time, and um, uh, greatly decreasing the um, the cost and 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 speed of production of uh, of the bricks. So in this case, we used. Um, uh, we um, used arches um, to carry the roof, um, allowing for a lot more interior space. It's a technique used by Hassan uh, Fatmi and others. So some pictures of this finished building. Um, and the final building I will show is, uh, is what we call the Moon House. It is uh, uh, inspired by uh, the Iranian architect Nader Khalili's work um, and uh, uses uh, earth bags, filled earth bags um, for the main structure of the building. The, the choice to go with earth bags was the client's choice um, as an architecture firm. Really the client is the one who uh, decides um, what uh, format, what uh, technique we, we would be able we would uh, be using. Um, so some uh, pictures of the unplastered building and the plastered building, and um, and finally the finished um, building. Okay, so um, some reflections um, for this work. Uh, uh, yeah, 
I, Yanni, we haven't really met the, the vision um, because, uh, well, partially we did. There's a lot of more interest in earth architecture. We are not the only ones working in earth architecture um, in, in, uh, in the Jordan Valley. Um, but we have seen a great increase um, uh, in interest ever since the, uh, our buildings went up. And uh, we even still receive requests for commissions today um, um, for more buildings, for more earth buildings. And so um, the, 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 the attitude towards earth is changing amongst some, but, um, but is uh, very well ingrained, in, especially in those who uh, experienced uh, earth architecture in a traumatic way or associated with the traumatic, the traumatic events of displacement. Um, despite the rich history of architecture, of earth architecture in Palestine, there's really very little research and documentation available. And I, I feel like this is one of the more important points um, to be followed is that there's a great, great need for more research and documentation of, of traditional building um, techniques in earth. Um, and also a great need for conservation um, and restoration of existing earth buildings. Um, for, for our work um, to actually make a, a difference, there really needs to be an initial um, investment um, in, in, in the mass producing mud bricks. Um, the, I think the incentive would be a price drop in the in the, in earth bricks, and that that would lead um, with everything that we have seen um, to um, to this change. Thank you. Um. So I'd like to say thank you to Ms. Massad for such interesting insights into ecological architecture and earth building. Um, I'd like to conclude the presentations by thanking all of our speakers for their time and for sharing their expertise on such important and relevant topics. Um, this takes us to the Q&A session. Um, I'd like to hand over to Diana, who will be leading the Q&As. Hello, yes, if we can welcome back all the speakers. We've had quite a few questions come in. So um, I will start with uh, you, Khaldun. Um, first of all, I too suffer when people are happy. So we, we have that in common. <laughs> um, what do you recommend? No, I'm going to start with this one. Have you had any troubles with the Israeli authorities? Have any of your works been destroyed or damaged? Actually, we most of our work is in area A or B, which means under civil administration, under Palestinian civil administration, and uh, in area A under Palestinian security administration. So we don't have uh, contact with the Israelis. We don't have touch with the Israelis. Uh, this does not mean that they did not interrupt our work. Some sometimes we work in area C, which could be uh, one kilometer from uh, our office. In El Bire, we work in Kofar Aqab, for instance, which is Area C. And uh, immediately when we started working, the Israelis come, the soldiers, they emptied the site, they made the search, and then they left. In one other place, uh, in uh, Kofar Dik, they came and killed a worker. Uh, so it happens. Uh, in Betixa, when we work, we need to leave our ID card at the checkpoint and enter the site. And after eight hours, when we finish the work, we come back to the checkpoint and take our ID card and, we're, and go home, which means there are a lot of restrictions. In Gaza, it's impossible to enter, to bring material to Gaza. So always I make this joke. <laughs> in, in Ramallah or in West Bank, we make restoration as architects, which means that we have the luxury to choose materials uh, from the market. We have market and we have materials to choose from to do design. In Gaza, it's the opposite. We ask the people that we work with, what kind of material you have? 
and then we do the design. So it is, uh, it is not that luxurious to work in Gaza. We did like three, four projects. And every time we have uh, the impossibility to get lime or to get steel or to get wood or to get all these forbidden, uh, they call it uh, double-use material in Gaza. So the Israelis, I think, uh, I, I would say they intervene, uh, but they intervene in Palestine, which is more important than intervening with Riwak or Khaldun work. I think they, they come to intervene in every aspect of our life, from the gas price to the materials, to the, our, our bedrooms, our, uh, our dancing steps in the streets. They intervene in, everything, in, in every aspect of our life. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, the next question I have, I'll leave you all to decide who can answer it, um, is from Dave Chappelle. The 2021 book Stone Men documents how skilled Palestinian stonemasons through economic need, i.e. helping build Israel, um, it says they demolish our houses while we build theirs. Oh, this is for you. Does Khaldun believe this sick and doubly cruel exploitation may yet hold some seed of hope, if only to keep Palestinian building skills alive? Yeah. I, I refer the, the, the guy who asked to, to rewalk, uh, to, to rewalk uh, um, uh, um, director, the former director, Saad Amri, wrote the book Murad Murad, and talking about the workers who built Israel. And one worker made this small story. He said, sometimes I go to Israel and I have all the uh, demonstrations. So I don't put enough cement in the mix. So he can imagine that the building will collapse one day, okay? But in the second day, he tells her the story. He says, sometimes I go, I have all the frustrations, but I know that history is so deep. And if it was permanent for others, it will not arrive to them. If it was permanent for others, it will not arrive to them. So I add some. I add more cement so the building will survive and one day I will take it. <laughs> so it, is, it, it shows that Palestinians have this mixed feeling. Uh, I, I think this question how it was put is very clever because the economic, uh, economic reason to work in Israel is a uh, is very strong one. Uh, people want to survive and surviving is almost resistance. Uh, those people, they need to, to have food at the on the table and they need to send their kids to the schools and so on. So they build Israel and they have the, the hope that the, the, the unfair uh, treatment of them will change. And this double alienation is, uh, is, is one day will, uh, will, uh, will vanish, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Um, before I move on, I just have one more question for you uh, from Diana Dark. Um, you showed a picture of the interior dome, um, and she was just curious as to where that building was. Yeah, this, this is a phenomenon of Palestinian architecture from late Ottoman era, early, uh, early mandate, when Palestinian rich families imported this technology from Austria, from Italy, from France, from Russia, and they try, uh, started decorating their, uh, their rooms and their vaults and their uh, ceilings. Uh, so this probably is one of Jaffa's houses, but we have a book by Sharif Sharif, and I sent her my email and I will contact her, telling her which, which house is this, and um, a link to the book, so it will uh, be sold. Fantastic. Um, and uh, we've got a question that's just come in about what the meaning of double-use materials are, so if you want to quickly... Yeah. Military or civil. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you can... I actually, this, this is absurd because there are 70 uh, uh, goods are forbidden to Gaza, including spaghetti. Yeah, I remember jam and t-shirts was on the yeah. list at spaghetti. one point. Just imagine spaghetti can be, I don't know how, maybe it makes people strong. I don't know, or sneak. I don't know. It's, uh, we'll never know because it's an yeah. issue with national security, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Abdul Rahman, I've got a question for you from Marcus Holside. Um, I would like to ask if there is any cooperation with any Israeli organizations 
working to reinstate and rebuild Palestinian vi villages and to identify and call out the architecture of occupation. I refer to Zokrot and the work of Eyal Wiseman, the founder and director of Forensic Architecture and professor of spatial and visual cultures at Goldsmiths University of London. Um, I'm interested in understanding if any cross-cultural relationships have been established. Yeah, uh, uh, actually from my side, from my research or my work, uh, actually we, we didn't have any kind of encounter with any Israeli, whether inside the state of Israel or outside. And it is also a dilemma, of course, to work with uh, such conditions. Uh, indeed, we have um, a very big no for working with any Israeli that is believing in the right of Israel to exist. We have a big no to work with any who has, uh, with even an Arab who has, uh, who declares the right of Israel to exist. So it is an ethical issue that we don't work with oppressors. But at the same time, I recognize that some works by other Israeli um, uh, professors, architects, and workers, it might be also a good uh, asset for the Palestinian asset. And indeed, in, in some occasions in Europe, I have met some of uh, former Israeli um, citizens who, who became um, clear about the idea of what is Israel doing in, in Palestine. And they, of course, uh, declared their opposition to the Zionist project. In general, it is uh, impossible to have such collaboration in Palestine, particularly because uh, of the entanglement of uh, conditions that uh, work. So even if you don't have an ethical stance that you don't want to work with them, it is also risky because sometimes they want to exploit you as well. Thank you very much for that. And I'm going to ask one last question because we're already over time, but it's just been so fascinating listening to all of you. Um, this is from Heather Fermaini, who I know has been super excited about the um, coming along to this webinar. So she asks, um, she says these are excellent presentations um, and that the term resistance has been used many times. Um, she'd be interested to hear how, Dana, how do you understand the term resistance? Does one, for example, grow up understanding the need to resist colonization? Difficult question, um, but a really good one. Um, I think if you're Palestinian, yes, you do grow up uh, understanding the resistance as the need to resist occupation because occupation is, um, is uh, still alive. The Nakba is still ongoing and we see, I mean, our children, my children, um, see and ask about um, why this wall is here, why can we not go to the sea, why, you know, so many questions and they are five and three years old and I need to explain to them even at that age what it means. And so, yes, I believe um, you do grow up uh, understanding resistance at a very young age. And, 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 and for me, I think resistance is um, um, perseverance of um, who we are as a people, understanding who we are as a people, understanding our own heritage and, and, and surviving this. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. You've been fantastic. And Amber, come back so we can thank you as well. Amber, one of our fantastic fellows, who I'm sure you'll all agree is just a bright light uh, for the future. So really inspiring to know that we're passing on <laughs> to safe hands. <laughs> um, so thank you again. And thank you everyone who's come along. We've had um, over hundred people come and join us today. The recording will be put on the website probably tomorrow morning, um, but it will be up soon and uh, you'll be able to watch that. So please do share if you found this interesting, if you think anyone else will enjoy um, seeing these amazing presentations, there were some fantastic photos in them. Um, I've also posted links to our upcoming events, but you can find all the information on our um, balfourproject.org website. Um, we've got very uh, exciting little campaign to get more friends. Um, so if you sign up for any amount of regular giving, uh, to the Balfour Project, then you will get a free ticket to our upcoming event in September, which is a screening of the human factor, followed by a Q&A with the director. More information on our website, links in the chat box. But if the links that sometimes don't work in the Zoom chat box, if they don't work, then do have a look on our website. All of the information is there. So once again, thank you all for joining us. Speakers, you've been fantastic.
audience amazing as always sorry we didn't get through all the questions and we will see you next time have a lovely evening bye thank you thank you bye thank you very much bye